Good morning everyone. Welcome back to my channel. Well, I just said good morning and actually it is just after lunchtime. Shadows are long and the shadows are coming from the side of my craft room as the sun moves to the west. So I want to do another dragonfly. And I got a bit of an idea for maybe this one. Yeah, maybe, maybe this one. I want to do a woven body on him. So that's the plan. So I hope you've got some stitching to do and you've got yourself comfortable maybe with a small snack. Now that I've said the S word, I'm going to be wanting to have a snack. I've just had a, um, a hamburger roll but on it lasagna i made a big lasagna for my dad's dinners and we've chiseled off a small portion for ourselves and a little bit left once i cut it all up and put it in the containers to freeze down for his dinners um there was <clears throat> uh, like a wedge left so i ended up popping that on a roll for gaz and i lunch and it was yummy full of carbs i think that's the word they use all the cool kids now what i'm thinking of doing here is I, i'm thinking a red dragonfly or a, a cherry red dragonfly and i'm going to have a go at weaving the body that's as far as i've thought so far it should work if we get our stitches down and then maybe over the woven area we create the detail that we'd want to see on the body like um, the separation of the head but then again maybe we don't need that i'm just going to trim off that little bit at the back that i've got after the knot I've got my container of um, threads here that is just great colors I think for these dragonflies so the plan is if you're wondering why is she doing dragonflies is to create little elements that can be used in future projects now the main project that sort of inspired me to do this is botanical beauties Lots and lots of flowers stitched onto a tablecloth, a secondhand tablecloth that um, I'm sketching, painting and stitching. And I, I really want to add some additional elements to it. And I thought, well, I better get a wriggle on and maybe make some pieces. And being that it's flowers, dragonflies popped to mind. Then I went down the rabbit hole of Pinterest. If you haven't linked to Pinterest or got the app for Pinterest, highly recommend it because it's just like going through a photo gallery of millions of images. You pick a topic, it's there. And of course, I just typed in stitched or embroidered dragonflies and oh my goodness. And I thought, well, if I can't come up with a few combinations of different stitches on these dragonflies, It'd be definitely worth a try. So that's the plan. I'm going to just pick, say, four dragonflies and just focus in on them and go, well, I like that stitch. Let's try it. Go to another dragonfly. I like that stitch. Use it as inspiration. And the plan is then to fussy cut them out. I did have a dragonfly on a scrap piece paper that uh, of fabric that I had cut out to show you in the first video I don't know where he's got to but he'll turn up one day he'll just fly back into my life and I'll grab him and stitch him and even if I decide not to use these on that project I would just like let me just reposition here I'd like to have a container of embroidered elements such as this to rummage through okay so i've got my let me zoom down i've got my stitches in and i'm going to weave <clears throat> question is do i change the color 
and have the warp thread, say a, just looked at that out of the corner of my eye. Gosh, well, I can't get this into camera shot. Let's just get my camera a little better positioned because I want to use the tray of threads that's sitting there to hold my frame so I can get my hand underneath and therefore keep it a little bit more stable. That's better. So, do we change our thread and do that? No. I think I want the body to be solid. Now, the plan is to weave backwards and forwards. And I always start through the center somewhere. And then fasten it down, the line is straight, fasten it down with a stitch, come through to the back, and that's my first stitch. It's not straight, I just, is it straight? Yeah, it's straight enough. Then I'm going to come back up next to it, and because I finished there over, I need to go under. And I've just spun my needle around so the back or the top of the needle is, is is what's leading the way where you don't run the risk of splitting a thread because if you split the thread and then your thread your line is stuck you can't do exactly what i'm doing here where you mush them all together to get them sitting on top of each other you don't have to push them together. You can have a gap. Between them and you get more of a grid like effect. I like it squished together. It looks nice and tight then. So I'm just going to do another row. They're not as close as I will have them eventually, but I sort of need to get a few rows done so that they sort of start bedding down together. Does that make sense? Once you get a couple in. And you can sort of just manipulate them back down and they'll sit. So now we're coming back across. Should glance up at the TV. Make sure I'm yep, I'm good. Okay, and back it down. And then back up. That's it. It's a nice easy step, this weaving, and it just is super cool when it's done it looks so cool and he'll have a completely woven little body my little fellow so now we're coming back up on that end that's it so what else could we do to him I have some nice red beads. Maybe we do his tail in red beads. That would look a bit cool. And then his wings. There's one butterfly, um, one butterfly, one dragonfly that caught my eye that had um, the fly stitch or feather stitch it was it was one of them i think it was that's feather stitch it was fly stitch as the center and then they had blanket stitched around the edge i thought well that's that looks pretty pretty neat end up finding some black beads too for their eyes these little guys that will do. So we're going. Just take your time with it because you're 
and you're spinning a needle around in your fingers and you don't want to jab yourself too. It's very easily done. I could probably even change the weaving thread around the head. Could be another option. So we're going under, over, under, over. I can thank Anne Brooks for weaving way, way back on the 52 tags. And weaving was a prompt and I was like, wow, just blew my mind. I thought that is going to be in my repertoire. Then I forgot about it for a year. Then it popped up in weaving of fabrics with the Roxy Girls. And then it popped up again with um, uh, Fleur Woods. She does a lot of weaving and she uses really thick fibres and it's just beautiful, especially when they're variegated. Oh, okay. So we've got weaving happening here that is the same as the previous row. So I've gone wrong there. See, it's the moment I stop concentrating, things go pear-shaped. So let's get ourselves under, over, under, change it down to the blunt end of the needle girl. I always hear my grandmother's voice when I talk to myself like that. I don't know, maybe I sound a bit like her and it's resonating a memory. I don't know. She was a pretty straight lady and I'm probably pretty straight. So maybe that turn your needle around girl definitely is a phrase or a, a term she probably would have used. It was many, many years ago when I was sitting next to her actually sewing. You know, as a little girl learning to embroider or fancy work. Okay, so where are we going under? My thread's going to come out of that needle, you watch. Stay threaded, please. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going. Oh, goodness, it's getting fiddly. How miserly do I need to be with this thread? Am I going to go right to the very end, trying to manhandle a tiny little piece? <laughs> Oh my goodness, the things we do, the scraps that we keep. It is good when we can use them, but in a project. Okay, so we're going under. So each time when you get to the end of the row, anchor your stitch down. If you just turn, you sort of your piece will be detached from your work and just swinging in the breeze. So, which is you know you might like that look depending on what you're doing. I guess that's nearly woven stump work. But um, we want this anchored. A few of you were asking, I probably should address this in the Botanical Beauties, being that I'm um, working on an old, just concentrating for a second guys, being that I'm working on an old tablecloth, what will happen when I go to wash said tablecloth? Well, the plan is not to use it as a tablecloth. It's just a, a substrate to work on, just a, 
you know, saved it from landfill. Embellish it some more and then <laughs> put it in the back of the cupboard until it's dug out in some archaeology dig of my house and they come across this craft room or she called it a studio and there's layers and layers of debris on top and they start digging and they come across a cupboard that has all this needlework in it I think wow look at that back in the day when they did things with their hands Now they just sit with goggles on and everything is just thought and everything happens with a flick of a thought. Where are the era where you actually used your hands? Could you imagine? If you watch a lot of movies that are, you know, futuristic stories, you just have to wonder. Oh, I heard the best thing the other day. No, it's not the best thing because it's probably sad for society. It made me giggle. I'm not a fan of the influences that are out there, the young ones that are faking traveling around the world to create images for other young ones to think that they're over in France or wherever wearing an outfit when they're actually just in their bedroom and they've used an editing program to make it look like they're there. There's yeah, heaps of them around. Anyway, and I'm right into all this because I've got young staff and they're telling me about all these influences and who they admire and and I'm like, oh gosh, it's just scary. So I guess I suppose it's no different to us following YouTubers. At least we're doing something productive with our time. <laughs> I'm sounding like a jaded old lady, aren't I? Anyway... My husband was reading an article. Actually, no, he was on YouTube. I'm just going to flip this out of sight and not off the back, guys. So just bear with me. Talk amongst yourselves. Have a look at the pretty things in there. So, yeah, hubby's watching a YouTube video where it was exploring what AI will be doing to society in the next hundred or so years, whatever the topic was, time frame. Anyway... He, he said how companies at the moment are giving free things to these influencers. Let's say it's Kmart or a designer and then these kids are creating content using those items and, of course, making a living out of it. Some of them making quite good livings, livings out of it. And they're influencing what the young people buy and do and how they behave, so it's become a thing. Well, AI comes along, artificial intelligence, if you're wondering what that is all about. Computers, computers that are going to be doing things more easily than what we have had in the past to the point where they are going to be pretty much able to interpret the next move without us actually telling them the next move, whatever it may be, whether it be making a car and a screw falls to the ground, the computer will know screw has just fallen, we'll pick it up and reinsert the screw into the right spot. It's that level of intelligence thinking. So he was saying that what's going to happen is companies will buy an AI program and they will be able to computer generate a beautiful young lady wearing their clothes in any location around the world to, for photo shoots and interactively exploring or whatever the product. And the human aspect of all of that will vanish literally overnight. And already there is, I think he said, three programs available now to companies who are buying them that will start that process. So when it was, what will AI be doing to us in 100 years? This was, what will AI be doing to us in the next five years? And we're already starting to see it because 
another thing that's bugging me is when you go to start a YouTube video that your favourite um, YouTuber's episode is on, there's always those couple ads at the beginning. And I noticed that a few of them are starting to blend. Gee, I watch a lot of YouTube. They're blending. So you may see one ad frequently and it might be selling, let's say, it's usually something health related, but let's say it's rubber boots. And you, you watch it every time you watch someone's video, there it is, that rubber boot ad. So it sort of becomes part of your daily routine. There's the rubber boot ad again. Then suddenly the rubber boot ad appears in someone else's ad, but it's saying something completely different. So they've taken, for example, the man that might be selling you rubber boots one week. Now the same guy cut in amongst another fellow is selling... I don't know, what's a random thing? Um, cars. Yet you look at it and you're thinking, hang on a minute, that's the rubber boot man. But the rubber boot man who is doing exactly the same actions is now talking about cars with another man over talking or interacting with him. That's AI. So what they're finding is these advertisement scammers because there is no rubber boots for sale, it's all a scam, until YouTube cottons on that it's a dodgy advertisement and kicks them off. Other scammers are taking bits from other ads and subbing in the voice and cutting and editing. So it's a brand new ad for a brand new company, but they've stolen the imagery from somewhere else using artificial intelligence. That just blows my mind. Recently, there was a... Um, these tablets were advertised by a famous Australian radio um, announcer. He's a great guy. He's been around for a while, very highly respected. Well, he come on a TV advertisement all over Australian TVs in prime time time slot advertising these tablets that help you lose weight. And you could clearly see him sitting there saying, it's done wonders for me. I've lost all this weight. You too can get hold of them. It's a subscription and yada, 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 whatever it was. I didn't actually see it, but I did see it briefly when it hit the news. And it seriously looked like this chap was talking on the ad, but he wasn't. Someone had stolen a video clip of him chatting on an interview in an idyllic location and then using, whoops, that should have gone more down. Hang on one moment, guys. Then using artificial intelligent, intelligence, moved his lips to make it look like, like edited in him telling the story about these tablets. And thousands of people sent money in. And when the tablets arrived, they had to take two a day. And then because it, they had their credit card, another pack of tablets arrived and another pack and another pack. So it was like a subscription every couple of weeks, these packs of tablets. So everyone's taking them. Of course, no one's losing weight. And this celebrity radio TV chap, he's just devastated he cannot believe it so he's now doing advertisements saying please please do not fall for it it's a con terrible absolutely terrible so and it's happening all the time you see it in these little ads that pop up before our videos and it could potentially be one of these cons because you look at them sometimes and going oh that's such and such from the tv show Gee, they're selling weight loss stuff now? Yeah, well, they're not. Anyway, I'm having a real gripe today. It's just getting out of control. And YouTube make us do some form of advertising because that's how they make their money. But it's like they're not vetting the behaviour going on. Not quick enough. Oh, I've had my grizzle. Let it go, Corinne. The world's just going to tick on without you being too concerned. <laughs>
Oh, gee. How much time have I wasted on this weaving? I've gone on a, a rant. I'm having a day where I'm having a rant. 25 minutes. Mm, we might as well finish it. Now I've got nothing else to say. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you guys can think of many, many examples in your country where things have just, I don't know. seem to be out of control. Information is just, I don't know. Oh, goodness me. Turn that blooming needle head around. I might change my thread colour. You know, I mentioned that we could do something different for his head. I think we might. So let's finish that weaving off. Actually, no, let's edge it. So I'm gonna come up over here, because I finished there, I'm gonna come up over here, and we're going to have a look at what a line, yeah. Okay, so let's get tricky. What could we do in the way of a color that pins down that thread. Should we go into the pinks? That'd be fun. Let's see what this looks like. So I'm going to now start another needle because my thread's just sitting there at the moment and I'm going to couch down an edge in a variegated Sue Spargo. I think they're called Dazzle, aren't they? No. Dazzle has the metallic metallic thread rolling through it. So I'm just going to come up beside and use my needle to pin down that little edge and it'll give us a little decorative edge. Yeah. And as it changes color through the variegation of pink, we'll see it appear on the edge of him as a nice little detail. As for his head, I might have to go further afoot to find a color to weave in there. If I can't find anything, yeah, no, I'll find something. I won't do it on camera because that would be boring TV. As it is, I've made you sit through 25 minutes of weaving and 25 minutes of grizzling about how the degradation of society is happening right in front of my eyes and I can't do anything about it because I'm just a minion. <laughs> just stay focused on the dragonfly, Corinne. Let it go. And just hope there's smarter people out there above me that are going to look after our well-being. Hmm. Do I sound sarcastic? Oh, now I've got a knot. That's because I was being sarcastic. Come on. Must be twisting a little bit. It's usually why you get a knot. So I've just unthreaded, given it a little run through of the fingers, the Sue Spargo thread. We shall continue on couching down to that bottom. Now, what we might do, now he's got a pink little edge starting to pop up on him. That thread is now completely couched not even in camera. He's zooming in business. That's treacherous. Oh, another knot. Oh, split the thread, split the thread, abort. 
stop what you're doing. Back it up. Maybe I should stop the video. No, I sort of want to nut it all out with you guys. And then I'll stop the video and go and do it and then come back and show you him finished. Problem is I'm spending too much time on the one thing. So what we'll do is that's anchored now. We're going to bring this thread up ready for the other side. We'll bring up the thread that I was weaving with ready for the other side like so and that'll go down that side and that thread will hold it down all right so we figured that bit out a bit of homework let's go bead hunting hey what have we got in the way of red glorious beads red bead department let me zoom up making you sick Oh, hello, babies. These I bought for the Roxy Christmas. They'd be a bit, bit special. Yep, really should use red thread. Um, hold that thought, guys. Just grabbing some DMC. Actually, no, I've got some neutral Nemo thread, which I don't use a lot, and I probably should because it's as strong as anything. It's for beading. This here, I got it from um, a forage when I was at their retreat. It was part of our kit because there was a bit of beading in the project we did. And it's like it's royal jelly. <laughs> and I just haven't been using it. But then I started doing a bit of research because once I did that couple lessons with um, uh, Jennifer Clouston at the quilt shop that she teaches at on the Sunshine Coast, um, if anyone wants to know more details, just ask me in the comments because I can't think of the name. Kim's Patchwork. Is that right? Just ask me the name. That needle works. Good. Just testing a needle. Yeah, um, the girls had that thread, this Nemo thread, in a lot of different colours. And I thought, oh, here we go. Now I'm going to have to invest in Nemo thread in multiple colours. And I sort of started looking into it probably about a month or so after I realised that there were colours and I had an example of it. It's based on silk. It's as strong as anything. If you were making jewellery, you'd definitely be using it. And I started looking around and these are so expensive. And, you know, the other thing that kept popping up was fishing, fly fish making and they were selling big rolls of a thread that, boy, it looked awfully like this stuff. Huge rolls for not a lot of money, thousands of metres. Yet they're selling us this for a lot more money. And that was the end of that. I sort of got to the point where I'm like, oh, do I really need to get it at this stage? It was coming up to Christmas and I just put it on the back burner. Now, before I go too far, I'm also going to turn on my iron and I want to get rid of that line because once those beads are in position, it's really hard to um, iron them out. So I'm going to do it now. I might even iron the top of his head there and get rid of that pen so that he's nice and crispy and not crispy what's the word it's not seen 
There we go. Now let's get rid of that tile. I think we can pull that off, no worries. Okay, so I've put in a couple little stitches to anchor my Nemo thread and away we go. So there's a couple of schools of thought. We could do one at a time with a little bead in between or we could do a line of them, say three at a time, which I'm tending towards and we anchor them down Just a case of sliding in my needle right next to his line, coming up again at the top. There's heaps of videos on beading out there. There's heaps of different ways that they do it. The main thing is you want stitches at least twice through. And if they are wriggling, Go back through again until they don't wriggle. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come up in between those first two. And then slide my needle through that center one only and go back down. So we start to anchor those beads and then I'll come up maybe at the bottom see they're not wriggling as much now we'll go through just this one we'll work our way back so there you go we are going to have a bejazzled now it's come unthreaded all right, I don't wanna to waste too much time on beads. I will probably go hunting for some smaller beads for the end of his tail. Let's come up there and then through. Now you could put three, four, five, six, seven, ten, twelve 10, 12 beads all in a row and then just work your way along until You've got them all nice and secure, that's good. So what I might do now is I'm going to come up again, go all the way through, and then I'll pick up the next lot of beads and follow the rest of his tail. So let's leave that for now. Let's have a look at time. Plenty of time. Let's have a look at these wings. Now, remember I said there was um, blanket stitch wings. Let's just play a little bit more with this. I think it'll give me a little bit more pink. I haven't done blanket stitch for ages. I've gone right off of it because blanket stitch was the go-to stitch when you were a kid. And it was never even. So I've developed a dislike for it and just stopped sort of doing it and there's so many other better stitches out there but let's give it a go you could make these wings and these bodies as detailed as you wanted it's oh the the scope so this bottom wing could be blanket stitch and then the top wing could be couched edging with a different finish altogether. Gee, I'm reasonably neat. Maybe I have learnt a few things in the last 30 years. Ha, huh, there you go. A child's mind versus an adult's mind. Oop, not... 
just tiny little stitches girl don't get ahead big shark's teeth it's a tiny little wing variegated threads very cool in this type of project I'm just starting to to change to a really pale pink yeah that's going to work a treat happy happy with that i don't think i've got enough room to be doing a fly stitch down the center mind you i think by the time i do don't unthread. By the time I do another row of blanket stitch, my wing will be pretty much full. So probably my wings are too narrow. Don't go change your technique. We're doing stab. We're not scooping. You can see guys concentrating here. See how the thread's twisting? We're going to be heading for a knot very shortly. So I need to let the needle dangle. See it's all starting to twist need to let the needle dangle after this do not see perfect knot coming <laughs> there we go so i'm just going to move it out of shot and let this needle dangle and get rid of that must be because it's a thread that is well it's not twiny twined it's actual just twisted. That's better. Now my thread's laying properly. You can't help but twizzle the needle as you manoeuvre it through your fingers. So it just happens. It's just part of the learning to spot when it's going to get too twisted that it, a little knot's going to form. pie shape happening now I guess this is the question do we change to a new stitch or do we keep going being that it's narrow I sort of feel like I want to change to a new stitch what could we do I'm thinking split back stitch actually. It'll give us a nice solid line all the way home. So the blanket stitch will be on the bottom edge of the wing. What's going on? There's nothing stopping you could change to beads on the top edge of your wings. Like it's just endless the possibility of stitches that you could do. Maybe I'll get more and more adventurous as we go. Oh, now we got the knot. See, I didn't pick up that we were twisting and tangling. home on the home straight 
So the top wing, what are we going to do for that? Because we won't see much blanket stitch. We'll certainly start it out with some in this corner and then stop at that top edge and do something on the way home. Maybe I could get a tiny itty bitty feather stitch down the center. No, it'll, it'll, a little fly stitch. It needs, oh. See, the thing is the teeth of the blanket stitch have eaten into my space where when I couched this one, I still had that space. What if we do, here we go. Let's, let's get adventurous. Why don't we do split back stitch around the top, top one. So no blanket stitch, it only appears on the bottom. Then that'll give me the center free to put. Now will that look weird because one pet one petal, one one little wing has it and the other one doesn't, where you know it really dictates that that's a dragonfly wing by seeing that. Okay, let's end this off. I need to make a decision, girl. Um, I feel like I need another colour too. What are we going to do there, guys? Is there anything special in my trick box of tricks? Here's a thicker. No, here's another pink. Oh, I like that. So we're now staying in the family, but we've gone thicker. So it's still in the pink family. But it's not that burgundy. That burgundy I just had out. You know, that would make a good head. No, it's too, it's too similar. We won't notice that there, well, unless I sat and stitch it. Gosh, the light's not real good for you guys. It looks better here. I could satin stitch the top of his head in that and make it mounded, like really build it up. Let's have a look at this pink. Oops, need, need a knot, don't we, guys? Minor detail. So, where will we start? Over here. We'll start this side because then the grain. Will be the same. There we go. Split back stitch once again. It's great that stitch because you're burying your needle into the previous stitch. You don't get that little hole which you can sometimes see when you do just straight um, running um, back stitch because the needle of course makes a hole in your fabric but by burying your needle into the previous stitch you get a really nice stitch and it nearly gives it a little effect as well, especially when you start using the thicker yarns or threads. Oh, I know what we could do. We could weave around this. No, that might look a bit odd. the possibilities guys <laughs> oh come on so I go 
forward. So I've got this nice big leaf, um, big leaf. I've got plants on the mind. The stitches are getting too big. Slow down. Can we be sneaky and go back through the fabric? Or should we unthread the needle and do it properly? It's all right, we're through. Trying to rush here, coming down the home straight. All right, now I might have a look for a stranded cotton in the red, like the body. How would that look? Or should I go really pale? So it becomes less obvious. Yeah, I've got to back it up, back back it away. If I go red, it's going to look real strong and dominant. We don't want that. Let me just turn it, flip it, finish it off with a little knot. Okay. Let's have a look. What can we do in that wing that's not too... Oh, we got wool. Look. Let's have a look at this. Pale. Meets the brief. Different texture. Love it. Because we just have the wackiest little dragonflies around, don't we? And we've got about eight minutes to work out the final piece to our little wing. I think that'll be good. Because I don't want that wing to be too dominant. As it is, it looks, you know, a little chunky. So let's do fly stitch this time. So we come up and then back down. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, just that. A little bit of raised texture there. No, nope. did my stitch wrong, didn't I? I bet you all saw that. No, you didn't because you're all busy stitching. You're not watching what I'm doing. You're just listening to me, which is good because you didn't see that I jiggered, jiggered the stitch. We've got to do a Y. So we drop that down there. All right. Okay, carry on. We can come up where we were over here and back. Stab stitch girl. Stabbing at it with one stitch at a time. It's hard to scoop your stitch, you know, where you go in and out and in again sometimes like that when you're in a tight frame. That's more for when it's on your lap and you're relaxed. When you're doing it in a frame like this or a, an embroidery hoop, it does tend to slow you down a little bit. I think the goal with the little dragonflies is to make them as interesting as possible. So as you look at your piece that a dragonfly is on, the more the, the viewer sees, the more they'll go, oh, look at that dragonfly, as they see, you know, five or four. Gosh, you could do even more stitches that make up his little, little body part.
and that's really cool. Now that wing is disappearing, so we don't want the angle as tight. Beautiful. I love it. I love it. I love it. You just can't plan this stuff. You just got to get on that needle and thread and play. Alrighty. I think we've got him sorted. I might get that all stitched. I think for his head, get ourselves a bit of thread there. I think it's too blendy blendy. It looks even worse. Like I'm looking up at the TV and it looks even worse for you guys. What have we got? Do we go light then? Do we do something softer for his head? Yes. Yes, that's what we do. And I'm thinking um, satin, satin stitch. Gee, that's a big blooming needle. That's just going to put a heap of holes in your fabric, girl. Put it away and use this one. So he'll still get black little eyes. So the question is, do we weave this in? I'm thinking we do the satin stitch because then it'll make it look more bug-like. It'll be a bit more bulbous. It will cover the pink woven stitch prior, but that's okay. So I will just whiz to the end with some stitches, which marks it out. Then I'll just keep working backwards and forwards over it. The only thing I'm going to say is that is a very similar colour to the back fabric. So it might get a bit lost. Yeah. I might end up coming over the top of that with something else yet. We'll just get it stitched. There we go. It looks better. I might have a think about that. I think I could probably do better. See how it's blended with the background? It's like all that effort and we've lost the point of his head. Hmm. I think I will take that out, guys. I'm not, not real happy with that particular thread. Okay, well, I'll have a think about the head of the dragonfly. And in the meantime, I'll stitch the rest of him, get him all done. And then I'll come back in a few seconds and show you how he finished up. All right, guys, back in a second. Okay, guys, I'm back. I haven't finished him yet, but I just thought I'd show you what I just did. I put on another three beads and I did the hole backwards and forwards to anchor them. And then I went back to the last of the first three and anchored into him as well. So they're really nice and stable. I finished couching that side. Remember I had the two threads sitting out here? I had a bit of thread left, which was this variegated, and I started popping with the leftover, if you can see it, the French knots using the leftover of that thread. So that's what I've decided to do for his head, using the Sue Spargo variegated. I'm doing some French knots all over the top of his head. Now, 
what that then made me think about is his tail is quite bulbous. His body is quite flat due to the weaving. And now his head is starting to get a bit of structure about it with all these little French knots. So then I went to the leftover weaving thread, which was sitting up here, and pulled it back down and pulled it up at his tail where it just starts. And I did a bullion stitch over the back of his body where the bead meets the weaving of the tail. No, where the tail meets the weaving of the body, I dropped a little bullion stitch in there with the last little bit of thread. So that then brings me to what I'm going to do over the body next. And I'm just doing a few knots while I tell you all about the grand plan is I'm going to use the same colored thread as his woven body, this DMC one. And I'm going to do lines of bullion stitches over his actual body. And I think that'll help bulk him up a little bit because at the moment he's got a bulky tail and this is the whole point of it. He's got a bulky tail with these beautiful big red beads. He's got now a, a bulky head with all of these little French knots that have appeared. They look like tiny roses sitting on the top of his head. So his body now feels to me like it's nearly left behind a little bit. So we're going to do bullion knots over his torso, if that's the torso of a dragonfly. Just do one more French knot. I could even use the Sue Spargo thread, but I think the variegation in the bullion knot might look a little odd. I'll just bring it up down here and lay it across. Oh no, looks good. Oh, what the hang. I've got thread left. Maybe I should finish off my French knot first. Oop. The other thing I want to do is I'm pretty sure I have a smaller version of those red beads. I'm hoping I do because then I can taper his tail a little bit with the final, say, six or seven beads that we put on to get that point. And then at the end of a dragonfly's tail is those two little um, V little V's I'll show you what I mean see that there so I'll probably do little bullion knots at the very end and sort of bring it into there but I'm hoping I've got small yeah I do there's the sister to that bead, the next size down. So that's good. I'll be able to taper that down. It's a different red. You know what? They would have looked so good between the big ones. If I had have done, oh, gosh, please tell me I'm not about to undo what I've just done in beads. Now I've got a blue version of these beads in two sizes. Well, actually, I think I've got a couple. Maybe the next dragonfly will do an alternating size because undoing it is just silly. Corinne, get it out of your mind. Oh, goodness me. So we decided we're doing, yeah, we are. Sue Spargo bullion knots over the torso of our dragonfly. I think that'll just give the center an interest. And then we've got on his little head, lots of French knots. Let me bring it up to the camera. What I might do is 
I'll stitch this and then I might wait till tomorrow morning when I have my good light and when I come back he'll be finished and I can show you him in better light he's just looks so flat dark and dingy you can't even see the bullion knots oh my gosh I really is best isn't that a shocking sentence I really is best it really is best if I film in the mornings unless I rig up some form of lighting system it's like the window of the afternoon light is washing out the um, the colors I think that's what is technically happening One bullion knot. No one will ever know that the first one was the thread left over from the whole weaving side of things. No one will know. There we go. Okay. That's the plan. I will finish it here. Pause it. Be back in a split second and uh, show you the finished dragonfly. I don't think I'll change any more plans. I think we've got him pretty much nutted out. So I better pause it, otherwise this will be an hour and a half video. <laughs> All right, back in a moment. Okay, I'm back and my little dragonfly has finished. I ended up using five of the smaller beads at the bottom and two bullion knots, all in the thread that I use for the weaving. So let me zoom in and just show you something else I did that I hadn't discussed. I'm gonna go right in tight. I pulled the curtain across too, so it should help. It looked better on the screen for you guys than it did on my TV. So I thought, oh, I'll come back and just show you it finished. So the thread that I use for the weaving of the body and the bullion knots at the end, I actually dropped a stitch over the middle, um, each one of those beads in between them all. I just could see that thread that I was using to stitch it down at certain angles. So I just felt a little bit better by dropping that color in between them all, which really just hid the anchor down stitch, which is more the calico color. So the Sue Spargo variegated thread, fantastic. That was that bottom wing in its entirety split back stitch and the blanket stitch. I then also did a few bands of a bullion stitch over his body and I stopped, I didn't do the whole body. I just didn't want to let go of seeing that woven uh, stitch in there. So I did one, two, three, four, five bullion knots and then ceased and then some French knots for the top of the head. The only thing I haven't done yet is stitch the two eyes on, which I'll do at a later date because I've only just noticed that they were on my table the whole time, the beads that I'm using for that. Now, um, so I'll get them out now and finish that when I finish this video. The other thing I wanted to mention, which you guys will probably ask, especially the new people joining this whole industry of slow stitch, finding two that are the same, is that bead container that you saw me pull out is a Elizabeth Ward is the brand. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, it's not cheap, $99. And there are knockoff versions of it coming around. Oh, I don't know if they're knockoff versions, but anyway, they're half the price. There's these little black eyes. Um, do not spill the beads, girl. Elizabeth Ward is... Oh, gosh, don't. Just put it down carefully. Let me zoom up and I shall show you this case. Elizabeth Ward, available on Amazon. The only difference between this one you see, which I think is the cheaper one for half the price, Craft Online. Australian company that ships overseas, $50 or $40, is there's a little dot where I'm tapping and that little bump allows that to secure. 
I just can't remember which one has the bump. I think the $99 one does, but they're both sealed just as good. I'm finding no problems at all. So if you're wondering what that tray is, head to Amazon, type in Elizabeth Ward or bead storage, or go to craft online and same thing, bead storage. And you'll probably find there's even more available now. So I will stitch on the little eyes. The other thing I want to mention, you're probably wondering where are his legs? They are gonna happen when he attaches to the item that he will end up landing on. So I'll fussy cut him out and then I'll stitch the legs in the process of attaching him. So it all sort of becomes a three-dimensional layered piece with his little legs being the, you know, attachment point. Okay. I'm going to leave it at that and you have a lovely day and I will catch you all in the next video. Bye.